So I was asked to talk about the role of beer and hydration after exercise and physical activity. And I'll briefly discuss why hydration is important, to say something about hydration after exercise, to say something about the key issues in restoring hydration status, to talk about the well-known fact that alcohol is a diuretic and to consider the implications of that for restoring hydration, and to think about whether we might consider a sports beer, which is a long-standing um, ambition of mine. If we think about not performance, but health, which has been a theme throughout the day and is the theme of the conference, there's good evidence for a link between poor hydration on a long-term basis and a number of disease states. So there's no question that chronic poor hydration is associated with a number of adverse health outcomes. There's some evidence for a link between poor hydration on a chronic basis and a number of other disease states. And I think the key question is, how strong does the evidence have to be before it's worth doing something about it? Mm. If the reduction in risk can be achieved with something as simple as looking after our hydration status, it's easy, or it should be easy, and it's free, so why don't we do it? But there are a number of other issues that come with acute restriction of fluid enter, or acute dehydration rather than chronic dehydration. And I'll very briefly show some results from a colleague carried out a few years ago. She took a group of healthy young adults. They came to the laboratory twice. On one occasion, they ate and drank normally for two days, and on the other occasion, they were slightly fluid restricted. So they allowed to eat normally, but fluid intake was restricted. And she measured a number of things over those two days. So we see here the change in body mass measured in the, mor in the evening, the morning, evening, and morning, when they ate and drank normally, and when they ate normally, but fluid was restricted. So they're losing body mass because they're becoming dehydrated. <coughs> they completed a number of questionnaires at each time point, and you can see there's a bit of a circadian rhythm, but if they were asked how thirsty they were on a scale of zero to 100, not surprisingly, they're more thirsty when fluid is restricted, and the mouth feels dry when fluid is restricted. So nothing particularly surprising there. But she also asked a number of other subjective feelings. And we see here alertness, tiredness, <coughs> headache, and the ability to concentrate. And you see quite marked deviations even within a few hours when fluid intake is restricted. And these issues, of course, were important for many aspects of normal functioning. So when I fly home this evening, I hope that my pilot feels not like this, but like this, and feels which one would I rather do? And where do I want the air traffic controller to be? Do I want him to feel alert or not alert? And this is just a mild fluid restriction over a period of a day. So there are some significant issues if we fail to stay well hydrated. But when we think about sport and exercise, there are some real issues we have to consider. If we are sufficiently dehydrated, exercise performance is reduced. There's an increased perception of effort. Those of us who take exercise to try and improve our health want the exercise to be as easy and comfortable as possible. If we're dehydrated, it feels harder, which means we do less. There's an impaired mental function, and there's an increased risk of heat illness. So staying well hydrated is important. And of course, if we exercise, we get hot. When we get hot, we sweat, and we lose water. You can see the sweat here. And we lose salt. This guy's just finished a London Marathon, and you can see the salt crystals crusted on his face where the sweat has evaporated and left the salt behind. So we have to consider the recovery process that involves replacing the water and replacing the salt. We can measure these things in athletes, and we've done it extensively. You can weigh them before and after. You can measure the weight of their drinks bottles, and you know how much fluid they've consumed. And from the difference, you can calculate how much they've sweated. You have to allow, of course, for other fluid losses that sometimes occur during exercise, so you crack, crack any urine and take that into consideration. We can collect small samples of sweat from patches at various sites on the skin, and we can measure the salt content of the sweat, and we can calculate how much salt is being lost and how much water is being lost. And we can therefore look at what we need to do in terms of rehydration. We can assess those losses, and we see the main electrolytes lost in sweat are sodium, 
and chloride. And if we measure football players or athletes of various sports, we see that sweat losses in a typical 90-minute training session can reach 10 to 12 grams. That's twice the recommended daily salt intake. So sweat losses can be very substantial, and they have to be replaced. But this is the model we mostly use in the laboratory to assess the rehydration process. We make a number of baseline measurements. We exercise our subjects intermittently in a hot environment and weigh them periodically until they've lost about 2% or sometimes 3% of body mass. We then make some post-dehydration measurements. We have a rehydration period of variable length when we provide either fixed amounts of fluid or ad lib intake of fluids. Over the next few hours, we assess hydration status by measuring blood volume changes, by measuring changes in composition of the blood, and by collecting urine output to see what the kidney has to say about the control of fluid balance. And sometimes we'll do a performance test at the end. So we've done many, many studies over the years, and I'll give a little bit of background. This is one of the first studies we did. We had two experimental groups. They exercised until they lost about 2% of their body mass. And then one group drank a low sodium drink, about 23 millimoles per liter, which is typical of the sodium concentration in commercial sports drinks. And one group drank a much higher sodium solution. Otherwise, the drinks were essentially the same. For each of the two groups, they did four trials. Each trial, they exercised until they'd lost about 2% of body mass. And then in the recovery period, they drank either 50% of the weight loss, 100%, 150%, or 200%. So four trials for each group. And we collected the urine output. And you can see here's the low sodium group, and this is the cumulative urine output over the six hours when they drank only 50% of their mass loss. And you can see, as expected, each time they pass urine, the volume goes up. When they drank 100%, the cumulative volume is higher, 150%, and 200%. And the same pattern for the high sodium group. But in each case, the volume is less for the high sodium group than it is for the low sodium group. So the conclusion from these studies, and I'll just show something that summarizes that perhaps better, the low sodium group, we begin you hydrated, we lose 2% of body mass. If we drink only 50% of what we've lost, we never get back to you hydration we have to drink sufficient volume. If we drink 100%, we just get back there, but the kidney continues to produce urine, and we never really maintain hydration. 150% and 200%, we produce more urine, so very quickly we return to negative fluid balance. If we have a higher sodium content, the sodium acts like a sponge and holds the water in the tissues, we reduce the urine output, and we stay well hydrated if we drink sufficient volume. So the conclusion is we need sufficient volume and we need sufficient sodium to maintain hydration after exercise. Now, what's this got to do with beer? Well, if we look at the public health messages that are often promulgated, this is what the British Olympic Association used to say to their athletes. Don't drink tea, coffee, cola, or alcohol because they're diuretics. This is what the British Airways in-flight magazine said until we persuaded them to change it. Avoid tea, coffee, cola, and alcohol. They're diuretics. That's all very well, but if you avoid them, people don't drink something else, and you end up even more dehydrated than you would be if you drank them. Now, we know that alcohol is a diuretic, and Grace Eggleton showed a long time ago that for each mill of alcohol you consume, it stimulates an output of about 10 mils of urine by the kidney. That's well established. So if we think about the implications, and I've got two examples here. One is drinking a pint of beer, as I did last night. There's about 11 grams of alcohol. There's 564 mils, or there should be if you get a proper pint. The 11 grams will give you about 110 mils of fluid output. So after drinking it, you're better off by 454 mils. If, on the other hand, I'd opted for a whiskey, which is a Scotsman I avoid, the alcohol content is about 10 grams, the volume is 25 mils, the 10 grams will give me 100 mils of urine, but I only got 50, 15 mils of water, so I'm 85 mils worse off. Of course, I'll get a volume diuresis with the beer because somehow I have to get rid of this 454 mils. 
but dilute alcohol will not have a strong diuretic action. So we wanted to investigate this, and we used the same sort of experimental model as we did before. We had a small group of volunteers. We dehydrated them by 2% of body mass, which is about 1.4 liters. And we gave them alcohol-free beer, to which we'd added 0, 1, 2, or 4% alcohol. And we collected uh, urine over the next few hours. This is the blood, oops, that was just the blood alcohol concentrations, which reassured us in that baseline was pretty much zero. This is the urine volume at each time point over the recovery period. And you can see with the 4% alcohol, there's a delayed urine output, but it's not markedly different from the others. And if you look at the same graph I showed you before, new hydration, lose 2% of body mass, drink 3% of body mass, and then we have a progressive loss. And although the 4% is a little bit less, there's no statistically significant difference. So there's no marked difference between trials. So when we look at this, we might conclude that the diuretic action of alcohol is overplayed when advising against its consumption after exercise. And if it's in a dilute solution, it's got a negligible um, diuretic action. And that's been uh, reproduced in a number of other studies. This was a very similar study looking at uh, alcohol in beer after exercise, and again concluded it doesn't have a diuretic action. Yet another study, this time from the Netherlands, their results were remarkably similar to ours. They compared a zero, an alcohol-free beer, a 2% beer, a 5% beer, and a sports drink. And you can see the 5% beer gives us a little bit um, poorer, but not statistically significant. So up to the typical concentration of alcohol in beers, there's not a strong diuretic action. I did find one study uh, carried out in Costa Rica, which suggested that if you give 5% uh, alcohol beer, there is a slight impairment in fluid balance after exercise, and there are some effects on some cognitive function tests. But that's the only study I've found which suggested that at these concentrations, there is a diuretic action. But of course, there are times when we want to stay hydrated, when we haven't just exercised and lost 2% of body mass, and it's interesting to follow up on those early studies and confirm them. And this was a study we published just a couple of years ago, where we looked at the effect of drinking a liter of beer containing 5% uh, alcohol or alcohol-free beer in subjects who are either euhydrated or slightly dehydrated. And these are the key results. When the subjects were euhydrated, this was the no alcohol and this was the alcohol beer, you can see a very small difference in urine output between the two conditions. So they drank a liter of beer and this is the urine output in four hours after drinking it. And you can see it's just a little bit over one liter. So what went in came out plus a little bit more. When the subjects were dehydrated prior to the exercise, and here the dehydration was carried out the day before, and they were fluid restricted overnight, so they turned up not acutely exercised, but slightly dehydrated. You see, after drinking a liter of beer, in the next few hours, you only get out 200 mils of fluid. So this is effectively acting to rehydrate. And the kidney, given the opportunity, will regulate fluid balance very effectively. We've recently extended those studies with a study we published last year in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and we looked at a whole range of different fluids and their ability to hydrate in individuals, again at rest, who had not been exercised. So in each condition, we gave them a fixed volume of fluid and we compare the urine output with the urine output when they drank plain water. And you can see a range of different drinks uh, featuring on the, the baseline here. This is where we would expect a significant difference from the distilled water, the still water control, which is given a value of one. So when we add electrolytes in a sports drink, we don't get much of an effect. But when we add higher electrolyte concentration in an oral rehydration solution, we get a significantly better uh, mm. fluid retention. When we drink orange juice, which is a high potassium content and a high sugar content, we get slightly better. And when we drink milk, which has got a high energy content, which slows gastric emptying, and also a relatively high salt content, again, we get better hydration. With beer and with 
caffeine containing drinks, there's no significant negative effect. So we're reasonably comfortable that whether we're well hydrated or slightly dehydrated, we are seeing consistent effects. Now, some years ago, we began to develop a sports beer with a major commercial company, but it got shelled for reasons unrelated to the product. And recently, people have begun to pick up on this, particularly some, some uh, guys in Australia, and they've suggested that beer might make a good sports drink in terms of recovery after exercise. Note, although they say a sports drink, this is not for consumption during exercise or before exercise. This is after exercise. And they followed a, an experimental model very similar to the one that I outlined. And their conclusion, a low alcohol beer with added sodium offers a potential compromise between a beverage with high social acceptance and one which avoids the exacerbated fluid losses observed from consuming full strength beer. So they're suggesting a relatively low alcohol concentration and a high sodium content, which is effectively what we had postulated some years before. And they followed this up by manipulating the composition of the solutions they were testing. And they said it's much more about the electrolyte content than it is about the alcohol content. And again, from the systematic studies we've done before, where we've systematically varied sodium, systematically varied alcohol, that's exactly the conclusion that we would arrive at. There is a study published just last year, and I think you have all of these on the memory stick that you got, suggesting that you may compromise taste if you add too much salt, and I think we would all accept that. If the salt content becomes too high, particularly if it's in the form of sodium chloride rather than some other sodium salts, then the taste is compromised. And that brings me to my final point, which of course is we need volume and we need salt, but they don't have to be consumed together. And the traditional message is to eat salty snacks when you drink beer. Now, barmen all over the world know this. And in many bars, you'll get free pretzels, free salted nuts, free snacks. Why do they do that? They do that because it retains the fluid, it reduces your output, you spend less time away from the bar when you could be drinking beer, and there's less mess to clean up in the toilets. So, <laughs> thank you very much for your attention.